Ahoy, and welcome to Titanic Talk Line. I am Alexia, and I'm excited. You know, honestly, I think I start every episode by saying I'm Alexia, and I'm excited too. Like I, I, uh, I'm gonna have a button one day, like uh, not an easy button. I'm gonna have like a figurine where you press it, and that's just gonna, it's gonna say that. But uh, I'll finish my sentence. I'm excited because this week I have one of my best friends in the whole world on, who's gonna talk to me about one of the worst shows I've ever seen. Hi, Gally. Hi, this is Gally, uh, and I am your best friend. Um, I'm also a damsel who likes to discuss things with you. You are a damsel who likes to discuss things with me, and that's really convenient because we are, interestingly, we're setting up a podcast, and it's, uh, what is it called? Uh, I think it has something to do with, like, oh, man. What is it again? Is it just like we're discussing, are we disgusted? Uh, Close. It's like... Okay. Da- uh, no not beaver dams uh not beaver dams not no that's our after hours uh podcast <laughs> <laughs> the things i wasn't expecting to hear <laughs> uh, it's, it is called damsels who discuss it is going to be coming out very soon probably around the same time as this episode so you should go ahead and give it a look and we're gonna be we are watching our way through the disney animated classics of which there there are more than i thought there were yes there are so many more <laughs> i think that's what fascinated me when is is when i looked it up was how many of them there were and also how many movies that disney has made that actually are not considered animated classics like i was both surprised by how many and also how few <laughs> were somehow well, were on this list <laughs> actually that's a really good question is there a Disney Titanic movie, an animated Disney Titanic movie. There is an animated Titanic movie, but it's not made by Disney. Oh, I know it's it's super fucking weird. It's 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 it it's real bizarre. It, I think it was made by a bunch of people on acid. That's not a joke. The proportions of how things move around. It's like what it's like when you are on acid. It's like that is actually what it looks like. So I think this person was just like. Yeah, this is what happened. They didn't do mm, drunk history. They did trip history. Well, unfortunately, what we're what we're discussing today is not animated, no. is bizarre. Yes. And I think, would you like me to just uh, do a little introduction for what we're watching? I would like you to just do a little introduction because it's, it, yeah, it happens. Yeah. It did <laughs> happen. It did happen. Uh, and you know what? Let's get started with this because we were watching Titanic. Um, Not that Titanic. one. A well-known romantic epic disaster from James Cameron, where we get to witness two doomed lovers experience a very short courtship. Wait, you know what? You're right. You're right. It wasn't that one. That's not the one that we watched. Hang on. I don't think Hang on. I have the right one. summary. Okay. Um, okay. Here we go. Mm. Titanic. Joseph huh? Goebel's foray into a film that nobody... Oh, no, 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 no. Wait, no, we... that's not... Sorry, hang on. We that's do not... have to talk about that one. We do. We do. But that's oh, not... To... That's not today. That, that should have Okay, been don't worry. Don't worry. That, I that, 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 okay. I got this. Titanic, a 1953 drama centered uh-huh. around an estranged couple... <sighs> hang on, hang on. No, I got... All right, that's a movie... We watched a TV show. We watched a TV show, yes, right? Yes, we watched a TV show. We, okay. it, it felt like a movie. It felt like a movie, but it was a TV. I promise it was a TV show. Right, right. Okay. All right. I got it now. Okay. Right. Titanic, uh-huh. the 1996 two part miniseries to come out right before one of the biggest films of all time with the same name, has closer. a fascinating backstory. Okay. I am closer. Okay. This is closer. Closer. All right. Hang mm-hmm. on. All right. One more try. Let's see if I've got it. Okay. Titanic is a 2012 four-part miniseries that feels as hollow as the unoriginal title this show shares with four other TV shows and movies. It's famously written by Gosford Park and Downton Abbey creator slash writer Julian Fellows and made such an impact on his career that there's one entire line about it in his Wikipedia entry, which reads, he wrote a new Titanic miniseries that was shown on ITV1 in March through April 2012 full stop that was the line the mini series was released for the 100th anniversary of the disaster and the concept of the short format show sounds fascinating Mm -hmm. an intricate web of stories featuring all class of passenger real and imaginary on the hms titanic told over four episodes as the disaster happens 
And perhaps in practice, fellow man fellows manages to weave together an interesting tale told from different perspectives. But I wrote this summary after watching only the first episode before I got to see how these all interacted. And after watching the first episode, if this is any indication of the rest of the series, this is going to be a weirdly paced tale of highly unlikable people meandering around until they either die a horrible and cold death or live a miserable guilt-filled life. The first episode is our introduction to a cast of characters that's much too large for such a short mini-series. There's no way we'll emotionally connect with all of these people, but I mean, let's just kind of try. <laughs> Our mostly main focus for episode one is the fictional Earl of Manton family, a bland generic father, Hugh, a not like other girls, daughter, Georgiana, and a mother who has a stick so high up her ass, she okay. might as well be sitting on a flagpole, Louisa. Yeah. They travel first class with two servants, and there's probably a story that we'll learn about the servants later, so let's just ignore them for now. The Manton family sure did. <laughs> we see the Manton family and a montage of other characters travel to and board the Titanic, including such stars as Captain Edward Smith, Harry Elkins Widener, imaginary Irish employees of Hugh Manton who have to stay in second class, and it's very important that they're Irish, Dorothy Gibson, a family whose kids with kids who are probably in the lowest of classes, and we don't really see them again until the end of the episode. Uh -huh. Molly Brown! Pair of Italian brothers who are serving all of the miserable people on this ship. There's plenty of other characters that are also thrown into the mix, but they are either quickly introduced and then forgotten, except for like a second or two later into the chaos, or they all revolve around the Manton family. Again, this mm -hmm. is all for episode one. Uh, yeah. Oh, there's also like a really quick throwaway scene where the lack of enough lifeboats comes up and that's just kind of shoehorned in. At the yeah, right there at the beginning. Episode. Yeah. Once everyone is on board, we casually stroll through about 40 minutes of people in first class judging everyone, Georgiana falling in love immediately with an American, the scandal, and Louisa what being scandal? prejudiced against literally every person, place, or thing. <laughs> Then the boat casually hits an iceberg and all of the first class passengers casually stroll to the lifeboats, of which, of course, there aren't enough. So there's kind of some panic, but the sound design makes it seem like this is just mildly inconvenienced for everyone. <laughs> the episodes end. The episode ends when Georgina is tossed into a lifeboat, but her mother would rather die than be sat next to other women who may be from a lower class and breathe on her. <laughs> There's no satisfying ending to the episode, and the cliffhanger kind of leaves you thinking, good, go die on the boat, Louisa, you giant piece of shit. Mm -hmm. And that's our summary slash introduction to Titanic, the 2012 miniseries. It's such a really weird thing. And the the first thing that's... Oh my gosh, I a plus time to get the hiccups jesus oh the, no right the first thing that struck me about this is have you have you seen downton abbey or any of downton abbey at any point <clears throat> so i have not but i feel like okay. i've seen like downton abbey it seems <laughs> so in the zeitgeist that it's one of those things where it feels like you've seen it that's fair so this had a lot of like you know how the joke is always like Lacroix is what would happen if somebody yelled at a strawberry thirty years ago or whatever the case <laughs> maybe I don't know yeah. like whatever the joke may be this feels like the Lacroix of um, James Cameron's Titanic mm -hmm. and it's also really interesting because Downton Abbey was such an opulent show like this I watched not the whole thing but I watched several seasons of it and like from the word go it's like this is a, a this is a show with money there is costume design there is ambiance there is set and it, it there's extras that fill in the scene in a way where it doesn't look crowded where it should not and empty where it shouldn't it, it, it there's thought put into it and the interesting thing to me is that the entire kickoff of Downton Abbey is that the heir to the Downton fortune and his father die on the Titanic oh I didn't know that that was the tie-in yes so <laughs> I thought before starting this series that it was going to be the story of, I looked up this guy just because I was like, I know he has a name. Um, his name is Patrick Crawley. That was the character's name. 
So I thought that this was going to be their story because they could then use the Downton Abbey tie-in, you know, tie it into the universe. And that way, mentally, people already associate them with the two. It does a lot of like the background character work for you because you're like, yeah. If you're invested in the series, you're like, oh no, this is how Mary loses her fears. It's all that it happens. Um, but yeah, they didn't do that. Instead, we open it up with this man who is very boring, and his entire facial expression says, I was a sickly Victorian child. I think that's also very fascinating that Downton Abbey <clears throat> has a Titanic tie-in because yeah. There's no reason that they couldn't have made that tie-in because no. we're not just looking at like actual real passengers on the ship. Like the main right. family that we're looking at right now, that Manton family. They're fictional. They're totally fictional. Mm -hmm. and literally anything could be done with them. A lot of the people are fictional. So the the people that you mentioned uh, when you were talking the the Mantons, they're fictional. And then the their servants are fictional. And then the um the other Irish family, the Irish couple is Batleys, also fictional. The Batleys are fictional. Yeah. The Italians are fictional. Like a bunch of characters are fictional. Now a lot of them are real, but they're in passing like they get mentioned randomly but yeah a lot of these people are fictional which is interesting because it gives you a lot more of that flexibility but yeah we're immediately introduced to this couple where it's like this dude has no personality this lady's entire personality is to hate everything and their daughter's <laughs> entire personality is i'm different they, it's it's like they felt like um we have way too many characters that are going to act true to the time period. So for our time period, yeah. these would be absolutely miserable, horrifying, racist, prejudiced people. Yes. But in that time period, that's how most people were, is that they're racist, horrible, prejudiced people. So I feel like they had to like add the daughter in because they were like, we need one person that's going to quote unquote connect with modern audiences. So we need that one person who's going to yell out this is racist and prejudice but it's so badly shoehorned in it's an it's extremely over the top too because like if she's a duchess or countess this woman she should even though she has very high standing it's like i don't think that she would just be yelling as her character is about how these people and that people and this person and that person it's like you have a right? little bit more grace than that in public because your reputation is extremely important yeah, keep yeah, keep that good face on. Yeah, and and we also get like introduced to Georgiana and the Mantons by her being in a holding cell because she was part of a uh suffragette march. Yes, uh I have written down in my notes that before I even wrote it I wrote that the line from the movie um movie from the show is <laughs> thieves and tarts. Yes. It's like what are you doing in the name of the Lord of Thieves and Tots? But before I wrote down, it was like, of course, they have to show us that only whores and rebels are uh, <laughs> present in this holding cell. And then, of course, the prim and proper Georgiana. Yes. Yes. So we have to show to she have doesn't her. belong. Yes. And then uh, is it on their? Are they like on the way out of the jail cell where they run into that guy as uh, into Ismay as he has a discussion where he's like, there's enough life in here. Get off of my back. Ah. Right? I think that was it. Like, we kind it of, like, so walked weird. by. It was so weirdly. Like, Why I looked down to make a note cell? and looked up and there was that, that scene. It, yeah, the implication was almost like there was a jail cell in the White Star Line building. It's like, yeah. oh, yeah, we build ships and we house prisoners. <laughs> but only women. Curious. Only women. That sounds worse. Because, <laughs> yeah, they immediately have a discussion where he's like, this one guy is like, but this other man wanted there to be more lifeboats. Ah, screw him. We have enough lifeboats. Don't worry about it. He doesn't work here anymore. It's just yeah. immediately setting it up to be like, here we go. It was literally Chekhov's lifeboat. And that it was, was like... Lifeboats, yes. And also in the first episode, this was like the only... Um, I'm going to call it a uh, technical detail that we learn <laughs> about the Titanic. Like... Okay. We don't really learn much about her as a ship in the first episode. Like That's typically in, in these movies, we get like a really nice, um, uh, you know, this is the great Titanic. It has this many rooms and was built yeah. on blah, blah, blah. Like we get more historical facts about what it was. We have that monologue ship. in the Cameron film from Rose, old Rose. And then as soon as we go in and meet 
young Rose and young Cal, he goes, it's over 100 feet longer than the Martin. They're just throwing Titanic effects at you via exposition. Exposition. Yeah, exactly. So so I think like the kind of the idea is there is like, okay, let's get the historical shit out of the way, get you to mm-hmm. learn about what the ship was actually about. And then we'll get into all the character development and the romance and the wee wee wooey. But in the mini series, it was basically like, let's show you the weird characters first. Uh, and then just tell you that the only thing you need to know about the Titanic is that there are not enough lifeboats. Don't worry about literally anything else. <laughs> yeah, and then we they immediately cut to the pier with where we see an A plus CGI Titanic. <laughs> and according to the wiki, there were twenty five hundred extras. But according to my notes, what I wrote down is there are seven extras because it looks like there there is nobody on the set. <laughs> I'm sorry, there is no one yeah. on the set, and. You know, once again, we're talking about grandeur. It's like the whole big thing about Titanic. It was like, there was people here. There was a crowd and there was this and that. If there was 2,500 extras, all 2,500 of them should have been in this shot. Like, look at all of the people. Look at the crowd. Wow. This looks yeah. like they went to go aboard the Titanic on a Tuesday that no one was ready. It was like, we're, we're the early boarders. It really did. It seemed like everyone was kind of, because <laughs> this is also the basically the montage, right? Where we get to see people traveling to the ship. Yeah, because we the Mantons and the Batleys are on the train, which is taking them there. And then, you know, we see that quick glimpse of another family and they're like walking or something. So, yeah, this is the yeah. like, we are all arriving at the pier. And and when when we're on the train with the Mantons, that's also when we get to meet the Batleys. And maybe I was missing this, but the Mantons were in first class. Yes. The Batleys show up in first class have a little discussion with the mantons where lady manton louisa is just again awful to them because irish um and then and then the batleys are told like oh you can't be here you have to go to second class which is this way and i'm like how were they in first class in the first place yeah i don't know it sounded like he was they were trying to find their way to second class but then manton was like are you looking for me let's have a conversation but it was i I forgot this doesn't take place during that conversation but um yeah it seems like the Batley was trying we're trying to find their way to their cabin and you know you know they're having polite conversation and then they left but late I think then in the next scene where we see Lord Manton talking to Lady Manton he goes why did you say that you weren't Irish or like whatever and she goes I'm not Irish in that way and I want to know what way are you Irish do you just drink like you're Irish? Like, what does that what does that mean? What 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 is she talking about? So, uh, so I know I watched all four episodes of this. I, I have also seen it. all okay. four episodes, but I had I for this recording I only rewatched the first one. But I have we, seen the whole show. So when we so I do have a quick question then. When we discuss this, do we want to allude to potential spoilers for the oh, rest of the episode? Question um allude to but not give them away okay i think that's fair so i am wondering (laughs) yeah (laughs) i i am wondering if um if lady manton meant that she was like not not a particular irish religion yeah i didn't know if she meant religion or politically because i yeah I didn't know what she meant, or I also didn't know if she simply meant, like, you know, some people are like, well, I was Irish, but I moved here so long ago, it doesn't matter. You know, people who are just trying to distance themselves from their roots. Yeah, but it was was such a strange throwaway line that means absolutely nothing to nobody, and nobody understands it. (laughs) No, and also, later on, there's another, there's a scene later on, I'm skipping ahead slightly, Mm -hmm. where... The Batleys are having an argument in their closet, and I say closet because they're supposed to be in a second-class cabin, but that scene takes place in a closet. Yeah, I think that's smaller than an actual third-class cabin. By the way, in case you're wondering if you watch this episode and the show and thinking, well, at least I'll see some pretty things of the Titanic, you won't. No, um, there is no, there's not a lot of historical accuracy in the sets, so they're having this argument in their closet. Uh, that's actually good to know that there's like no historical accuracy oh my god that first that. oh my god that first class dining room it's like what hilton are you filming this in <laughs> um but they have this argument and sh- i don't remember how it got brought up because you know 
John's trying to keep the peace a little bit with his wife who was like losing her fucking mind <laughs> about the Irish thing. And I don't remember how it got brought up, but she has a line that made me laugh because I think he says, well, she grew up in Ireland talking about Lady Manson and Mrs. Batley comes back with, if I grew up in a kettle, would it make me a dog? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> he goes, well, she did grow up in Ireland. She, if I grew up in a kettle, would it make me a dog? She was so... <laughs> She was so, it came out really fast. I will say it, it was easy to miss, but it was firstly an extremely funny line. Yeah. But secondly, it goes back to this whole thing. It's like, what is this thing that everyone's talking about where it's like this Schrodinger's Irish woman where it's like, she <laughs> is, but isn't Irish, but you're not Irish, but you are Irish. But if, you, if she grew up in Ireland, but apparently doesn't make you Irish, but what else does make you Irish besides being born and raised in Ireland? I, 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 I I don't know I was also half expecting like so so something else I think to know about this this mini series is the way that the episodes are formulated which they don't tell you is no. it's a bit of a um uh a situation where you see the same story told and retold every episode just from different perspectives yeah so you get to see like this iceberg shot for example from three people's point of view yeah and, and it's not good anytime in this particular episode, we spend so much time with the first class, first class people that I was just waiting for the iceberg to hit. I was just like, please end my misery. Because if the women, the women in the show, at least as of episode one, are presented in two ways. Either they are um, positive because they are hopeless romantics and are going to fall in love with literally everyone or anything around them or they are absolute miserable women who hate everything and every reaction is negative and you see this in one of the two of the scenes that are the most historically inaccurate which is this post dinner social hour dancing deal um yeah men and women especially a first class would not be flirting they would not be dancing together they would not be playing cards together they would not be in the same room together oh you're saying dorothy gibson just sitting there playing playing (laughs) cards with the men she might as well be having a cigar or something like that was totally fine smoking Yeah, yeah so immediately um harry widener is his name the young guy starts dancing with Georgiana and she basically dismisses him because he's she's like you're not my type and he's like what is your type and she's basically like Hamilton that's basically what she said she was like I only like rebels and poets it's like what the the fuck are you talking about I think really she was like you're not Leonardo DiCaprio I'm just gonna wait (laughs) she didn't realize she was in the wrong um (laughs) movie but that that was super weird to me how like, very flirtatious everyone because again like this is supposed to be a period piece and that is not how things went but um the other thing that i found super weird was the mansons acted like they'd never heard of an affair before like everyone acted as though guggenheim and madame aubert like being a famous affair couple they were like what he said they're not he's married she's with a what he literally was talking to somebody like he had like breaking down an affair. He's like, he's married to someone else. <laughs> what on earth is he do- he's like, are you out of your tits? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Louisa was clutching her pearls. Louisa Manton was clutching her pearls every second of her screen time. Everything made her upset. <laughs> Inclusive. <laughs> It was just so odd to me how okay she is with her daughter dancing in public. Yeah. But she... a, apparently a, an affair happening that everyone knows about and is in the papers and shit is just like, what? <laughs> I wrote down um, two lines. I believe that these are two lines from Louisa. I wish I had <laughs> said who they were attributed to, but they sound like her. <laughs> um, that was said during that scene that you're talking about where everyone's convivial and dancing and all of that. Uh-huh. Um, one of them was Louisa says, "I'm not a woman of the world." Yes, which is such a self insult. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then the other one was, "We are a political family. I believe you are in trade." Yep. 
she is publicly a bitch to yes. everyone she's not even nice to people she should be nice to she's not nice to the people at her table when it turns out she's like oh captain smith's dining at our table the way she said it was the same way that i might say that elon musk is coming to my house yeah that was the same way like oh elon it's... musk is coming here great she hates everything and everyone and it is it's interesting because as we you know you they're clearly building her up and you know later on they try to give her this redemption arc but it's like it doesn't actually excuse any of her behavior at all and they don't give her any like this episode there's nothing redeemable about her whatsoever she's awful she's just really really rude yeah to and again like i said everything and everyone and so on the train Manton did the uh Cal Hockley, why don't you join us for dinner and mm-hmm. regale our group? He did the whole come to dinner thing. He invites them the the Batleys to tea. And again, you are the hostess of this event. Like you are in public. She first of all shows up to the table and kicks Madame Aubert out. Yeah. <laughs> was sitting there first. And uh she then sits down and is rude again to everybody at tea she's rude to her husband she's rude to the batley she's rude to literally anybody else who joins and then talking about like what's going on with dinner i don't want to sit with these people i don't want to talk to those people it's like what are you here for right like she also there's a lot of i'm trying to think of the right term for the type of acting that shows up in this in this mini series because it's a very annoying form of acting which is like um it's like silent and not answering questions and when you do speak it's with the fewest amount of words possible and she does this a lot and it's it's yeah her character in particular yes yeah her character in particular it's like there's no there's no levels to the acting and i'm sure this actress is absolutely wonderful Mm -hmm. um and it's not just her i suspect that this is kind of the directing because there's a lot of people that act like this in this mini series yeah but it's just you just are trying to be the strong silent type there's also interestingly not her character clearly but there's also some characters that are clearly written in a way where you're supposed to think that everything they say is interesting and profound yes but it's flat i don't think it's this it's not this episode i think it's in the next episode and i'm gonna try to write it down but there's a line from like one of the stokers i think Whereas something along the lines of, this isn't it, but it's something along, and people just, you know, the servants bend down, begging for the lashes from their masters, not realizing that they are the ones delivering the blows to their own backs. That's not the line. I'm making it up, but it is something like that, where you're just like, I know that whoever wrote that was like, yeah, they're going to yeah. feel that. It's going to strike them right here. But in re- reality, what happens is this guy says that, and I, in my bedroom, giggle a lot. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of how I felt when when Louisa said the whole "we're a political family." I believe you are in trade. I'm like, ooh, I know the writer wrote that and was like, yeah, take that. That's going to be such a harsh, cool line. And I'm just sitting here like, of course you're okay. saying that, right? <laughs> okay, I don't know whoever wrote the "if I grew up in a kettle, would it make me a dog?" line. That's a great line. That's a good one. That's that a good is line. an extremely good line, and I think I'm going to try to use that sometime. <laughs> if someone ever tries to like insult where you come from or something, <laughs> like whatever, just be like. Sorry, turn that around on you. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to fit that in the conversation, but I'm definitely going to try. I look um, forward to learning. <laughs> sweet. Um, speaking of inaccuracies, can we talk about second officer Charles Lightoller for a little bit, please? Uh, please do. Please do. Okay. So, I want to know about the inaccuracies. A couple things here. So just for anyone who doesn't know, Charles Lightoller is the um, highest ranking officer that survived the Titanic. So he lived. Um, in the movie, he's the, in the, in the camera film, he's the one wearing the turtleneck. Um, Mm -hmm. and at one point in time, he, uh, Mr. Andrews yells at him. He's about not filling the boats up enough. So, so that's Lightoller. He, um, in this mini series is an embarrassment to the white star line. The white star line would never, uh, you do not come in and socialize with your guests. You especially do not remove your hat indoors while you are in your uniform what are you doing don't do that and yeah, they had very strict code about 
interacting with passengers like obviously if a passenger like you see manton is like mr lightoller i can't find my way down to second class he's "Ah, this way i will show you but if you know dorothy gibson suddenly doesn't have a dance partner that's just not your concern yeah Uh, that was super weird also there's more than one officer on the titanic but for some reason the script only writes in him because he's in like every scene he's he teleports he's just everywhere I was thinking that I was thinking how for a boat that has 2000 passengers yeah or is it everyone was that passengers and crew um about 2200 a people okay so yeah for 2200 people it sure is a small small ship because we see the same cast of characters just kind of cycling around each other or just finding their ways to each other and especially yes the the um uh light troller light troller Light toller. Um is he stalking? He seriously who is he following? He just shows up. Yeah. And the real light toller himself testified to the size of the real Titanic. He, you know, he was a career seaman, by the way. This wasn't his first ship. But mm-hmm. he himself was saying, like, the Titanic was so big, it took me two flippin' weeks. That's not the exact that's not the exact quote. He's like, it took me it took him two weeks to get it down right. And somehow this light toller has it down so well that he can just hold his breath and like apparate like he's in Harry fucking Potter because he is in first class. He is in second class. He is in the cruise quarter. He is on the iceberg. He is in a funnel. He is upside down. He is in Antarctica. It's like, why are you everywhere? And how are you everywhere? He is dancing with Dorothy Gibson. Why are you in my bedroom? Why are they just, sir? That last part was actually quite scary. I did see him flash for just a second behind you in your bedroom. It was no i can't get him to leave i'm sorry i'm so (laughs) and you won't be able to because we know he's a survivor i know that's the thing it's this ghost following me around but just it it there's a lot of things that are inaccurate and some of them are you know i understand even in the you know even in all these other things there's a lot of inaccuracies but there are some that would have cost you nothing to have and having a crew member act like a crew member would have cost you zero dollars well, you know what else you you brought up about um, how the ship, like architecture itself, is super inaccurate mm-hmm. in the show. You forget that you're on a ship. Yeah, like in the, like yeah, you I never do. see the ocean until literally the iceberg hits, and yeah, until until you're supposed to. Really, until you're supposed to. And I was like, huh. Well, I wonder when we're going to see the ocean, and then the iceberg just kind of showed up about. Um, 33 minutes in yeah and even like there's a couple scenes where they were supposed to be walking around on the deck outside there was no indicator that that wasn't the lobby of a hotel yeah like the ship might as well been in the the port still like it (laughs) maybe they were just kind of hanging out there for a little bit and then suddenly they took the ship out to sea i don't know and just the way that the pacing was is that you were saying when you hit the when they hit the iceberg you have no idea that that's what's about to happen. Like you're watching the show and watching the show and nothing's happening and nothing's happening and nothing's happening and nothing's happening. And to be fair, in in reality, it is documented that the actual way that, you know, the iceberg thing actually hit was not as exciting as it was in the Cameron film. There wasn't yelling, there wasn't running. It just makes good cinema. And that's the key there is that it makes good cinema. Mm -hmm. the real way it probably happened was more like this show but they then added the weird dramatic overscore to it which didn't match the pacing because if you watch the 1958 a night to remember they do the more slow dramatic slowly dramatic way but they don't have this jaws theme-esque background where they're like nothing's happening but you're supposed to be feeling things Healing there's tension, then there's tension coming up on their sound. No, and that's what they did in this one. There was a bunch of noise for nothing happening. I I made such a similar note about the music. Um uh, because the way that I the way that I was thinking about it was the the slow cascading music sounded more like the opening to Jurassic Park. Like when you first see the park and there's like opportunity but you also know something's going to go terribly wrong mm-hmm. with the dinosaurs so it's kind of like ooh, i'm excited but a little nervous 
but it wasn't what I feel like the music should have been, which was when the T-Rex is trying to get into the car in Jurassic mm-hmm. Park. And it's just like super harrowing and you don't know what's happening. And it's very mm-hmm. scary. So I guess what I'm saying is I somehow managed to relate the Titanic to Jurassic Park. And now I'm wondering if there's a movie where Titanic is just filled with dinosaurs. Probably, yes. But the thing about the music, though, is that it can really make, I mean, this sounds like such an obvious thing, music can really make or break a scene. <laughs> but, you know, it, I, again, I'm I'm very familiar with the Titanic film. And mm-hmm. I, I have to say that I do think that the iceberg collision, co- the collision scene in there, it favorites a weird word, but I find it to be one of the most impactful scenes. And it works really well together with the cinematography, with the little acting that is there. And I, I don't mean little acting, but I mean, like, there's just not very much of it. Yeah. And with the score, because it does a lot. So there's a lot of little scenes where there's a there's a portion where there's just strings and it's just going and that's when they're very slowly approaching the iceberg and that kind of gives you that feeling of tension you're closely cropped on murdoch's face he's staring directly past you going turn turn there's it's building tension in a way that you can feel and mm-hmm. then when it hits the iceberg it is the full orchestra there are horns there are strings there's percussion it's coming in basically just to be like it is all happening and you're cutting back and forth between different places show chaos here chaos there chaos here not as much chaos here but someone notices something is wrong here there here there men are being swept away by water up on deck you're it's it's visual chaos in an organized way to build the story the yeah. entire time you have the score that has built around you this scene could have been fine doing this slower approach if they made a score to match it, if they'd just taken those tension elements, like, you know, the that area that's very reminiscent of Morse code, mm-hmm. that da, 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 bringing that back in and just having like a slow string that just is a little staccato, like to show that you're waiting. But instead it tried to go for this not quite dramatic, but dramatic alluding s- not very impactful score. And it just made it Eric. Scene- it was very generic and it made the yeah. scene confusing. Yeah. And and am I wrong or did it just seem like the same music was playing from before they hit the iceberg to the end of the episode? Like there was no um there was no real difference in in swelling. There was no difference in uh the the it, it was like they were just playing kind of the same uh stanza over and over again. That's what it felt like. Yeah, I mean they clearly didn't have, you know, John Williams on the case here, but it was so repetitive in a way where, again, you know, this is supposed to be, this is supposed to be in any Titanic show movie story. It's like hitting the iceberg is the pivotal scene. It is when literally everything changes. That's when all of these characters that we've been introduced to, we're supposed to find out what, like when this iceberg hits, we find out what happens to them. We find out if they live or die. Yeah. So this is supposed to be that scene and you don't feel it that that way. It just kind of happens. I mean, I guess to be fair, the characters don't really feel it either because we also don't have any sense of urgency from them whatsoever. Even though there's a scene where we have the attendants essentially speed walking through the first class cabins telling yeah. people you need to get out of here and put on your life vest everyone's just kind of like okay i assume that this is some type of drill even though nobody told us anything about a drill in the first place like n- everyone it's just also almost midnight does. yeah yeah it's there no one at all at any point has any urgency whatsoever and by the way by the time so this they I actually do not like the way that they time hop around in this show I think they think they're being clever but what they really do is simply confuse everyone because in one episode they've brought us from people arriving at the port to hitting the iceberg and that especially considering as you mentioned the number of characters there are that is not enough time for that moment to happen especially because this isn't a spoiler this moment with the iceberg hitting happens in every episode we at the same time every episode Mm -hmm. this happens every time so it loses its impact basically each time no pun intended but 
by the time we get to the end of the episode, what is supposed to be like the last lifeboat, they are loading the collapsibles, which means all of the boats are gone. We've reached the point where Bros goes, the boats are fine, and everyone starts panicking. We're there already. Um, no one seems that panicked. They seem more like they're disappointed it's taking too long to get into Coachella. Yeah, like, it's, it's not us really jumping too much plot here to say that when the iceberg hits people kind of slowly walk around and get into the boats and there's some conflict there with the boats lowering and all of that and then before we know it we're on that last boat we have georgina georgiana literally being shoved into the boat for her safety and mm-hmm. louisa standing there at the edge kind of being like no I think so i don't mm-hmm. know Wait, what literally the last boat and you're still going to be absolute weird snob because by that point in the sinking by the way by the time that the last lifeboat is gone or going uh it was visibly sinking the whole reason that the whole reason that some of the lifeboats were lowered less full and that some of the there wasn't as much urgency in the beginning is because people could not tell the boat was sinking yeah they simply couldn't but there became a point where it was abundantly apparent that's what's happening and people you know you read about it they swarmed the decks people below decks were frantically trying to get out there was a sense of urgency throughout this entire boat this was just people leaving a music festival it was Mm -hmm. and i don't know this probably has to go down to the direction because i can't imagine and i don't i don't recognize any of these actors from anything else i'm sorry about that guys but I can't imagine that every single one of them sucks. There's no way that every single actor and the actor and actress in the show was terrible. But no one gave a great performance. And that's just telling me that there was a common denominator problem. Because I'm betting you, like, there ha- you, you mean to tell me that they couldn't get 2,500 people to act like a panicked crowd? Yeah, and, and I did recognize some of the actors. Um, oh. So I recognized um, one, of the, one of the maids that we see uh annie desmond i want to say yes yeah so she's played by jenna coleman who was in uh doctor who okay one of the more recent doctor who's um and harry widener was played by noah reed who is patrick from schitt's creek uh which that okay. was a that was a fun little moment for me to be like is that patrick nice. is that patrick um was patrick and then this is a deep cut that I don't know how many people are going to be familiar with, but Sophie Winkleman played Dorothy Gibson, and I recognize her as Big Sue's from a, I'm going to call it a cult classic uh, British TV show called Peep Show. Ah, I don't know. I will just say cool. this. the uh, Sophie Winkleman seems like a, a, a lovely posh person, um, but she's very British, and I could tell her yeah. playing an American, her accent just kind of kept slipping there as Dorothy. I, I did find that very noticeable, which again, like I, it is what it is, but yeah. Well, all that to say that it's like not, there's no way that every single one of these actors and actresses is bad. There's just yeah. no way. Oh, absolutely not. Actually, uh, we don't really see him the, the first episode, but um, I'm going to try to look up his name. Uh, Stuart Hart, who we mm-hmm. see in future episodes, is played by Ralph Innocent, who his voice is very recognizable, and uh, Alexia in particular, you might recognize him as Lorath from Diablo 4. Lorath. He's a very deep rasp. Yeah, yeah. Now that that, that it, voice I'm is like, like, oh my god, yeah! That's extremely yeah. funny. I'm gonna yeah. bear that in mind watching the next few episodes. So yeah, so there's like, and that's just, you know, four people out of this massive oh and of course toby jones how could i forget toby jones uh who plays john batley who has been in many he's been in a bunch of stuff he's been amazing he is someone that i i actually recognize because i once confused him for timothy spall yes i can understand that i can understand why but yeah (laughs) like chernobyl Uh no and (laughs) the whole point of my bringing that up was simply to say that the performances that I'm getting, I think, has way more to do with the show than it does with the actors. And mm-hmm. I find that disappointing because there is a lot that could have been done with this. 
I mean, clearly yes. there's a lot of creative ideas. You know, we need the, like, there needed to be, some of these plots needed to be dismissed just because there's too many, but there was a lot of promise here. They have great actors and actresses. Yeah. It is one of the easiest historical moments to make media about to get interest in and that's not meant to be weirdly insulting but it's like people lap up titanic content it's simply how it goes and it was made by julian fellows who has made a beautiful and opulent show in the past there was a lot of promise here for making something that i genuinely think could have been really good but instead it's just weird and involves a scene where mrs batley during the evacuation of the Titanic goes on a rant at Lady Manton about question mark. Yeah. We find out later what it's about, but I still do not know why she decided to bring it up for any reason. It was bananas and it was ridiculously weird. I was thinking about that throughout watching this entire series. There are a lot of moments when the iceberg hits and we get to the panic of everybody trying to leave where there's a lot of these little side plots that are continuing to come into play because there wasn't enough time to resolve them before, before the iceberg them. hit. So yeah. we get moments like this, which are incredibly confusing, where we have people that know that there is a imminent emergency happening. Current and present danger. But put it aside for a minute because of their personal grudges against another person. I live to be so petty that when I am literally being dragged to my death in a life vest, I am screaming at somebody about a roller derby injustice. Yeah, may I be so disconnected from reality that when the tornado inevitably hits and I have a twister-like situation where I'm getting picked up out of my bed and I'm taken by the twister, you can just hear me saying, fuck all of you for these various reasons oh and then i get hit by the cow like and it get, and uh, having seen the whole show like and i'll ask you as well when we know now why she, when what she was yelling about does it make any sense for her to have brought that up at that moment at any point and also why was she yelling at lady manton absolutely not there was no reason for this, any of this to be brought up <laughs> this was just her continuing her weird irish vendetta these two women have a weird irish vendetta they do also, and they're also sorry you were gonna say they were also they're also just both absolutely horrible miserable people uh-huh. that uh, decide to be miserable to each other for reasons reasons that i that are very hard to understand and again the whole irish thing is extremely confusing to me because it, i think it's it, it, i find it especially confusing because it is between two irish people who yeah. are, and it doesn't make any sense it's it you know it, it would be different if they were trying to make a statement at the time of you know and there was there were some statements you know captain smith was like what is an what is an italian doing in this dining room which was it's like once again we have to establish that there's a lot of racism in this time period but whatever and it just seemed at least that sort of quote-unquote made sense where there was a lot of like english anti-irish sent i mean anti-italian and anti-irish sentiment at the time but yeah. this was like irish on irish crime like it was it was a very weird vendetta to have and it never to my understanding uh gets dressed really well i mean we can't say too much about that because we have to discuss it no, further in the future true. episodes because like right? you were saying like the pacing on this is so it's it's frustrating it's frustrating that they show us that scene now when we're not going to get closure for it until i think the fourth episode third or fourth mm -hmm. episode and, and it, it <laughs> it's super weird also uh there's a bunch of character errors here about light toller and i can try to quickly read through them oh yes because these are really interesting here but a lot of them are what i said here um light toller's depiction is wrong um <laughs> they say he's wearing a second officer's uniform um they also say in real life he and burdock didn't have time to change uniforms since once wild arrived because long story short Chief Wilde was brought in basically last minute, which bumped down Murdoch from chief officer to first officer. Light Toller was bumped down from first officer to second officer. They wear slightly different uniforms. However, 
I this says it's not sure, but some people aren't sure what uniforms they actually wore on Titanic because both Murdoch and Lightoller would have had still their second and first officer's uniforms. These were new uniforms for them, first and um, chief officer. That's fair. So that one, I'm not a hundred thousand percent. I almost tried to be Scottish. I'm not a hundred thousand percent sure on that one. Let no one come <laughs> after me for that terrible accent. But it also <laughs> says here, it's like he's shown in many different parts of Titanic and interacts with Dorothy Gibson. He would have only been assigned to oversee the travel of Titanic and officers were forbidden to fraternize with passengers. Yeah. He's also the one who helps the Earl of Manton, but in real life, Lightoller wouldn't be the one to ask for getting directions to there. He's also seen handing out hymns for the passages of the first class dining saloon, a job meant for stewards. He never ventured to warn the passengers of evacuations. Instead, he would have been working. He was in charge of the portside evacuation. He was not running around this ship. Um, and while it's correct that Lightoller lowered some boats at half full, he never suggested that passengers were like, oh, you'll just dive out there and swim. Yeah. That's what's happening. And the other thing is that he's seen lowering lifeboats on both sides in real life. He was only on the port side. Officer Murdoch was the only one who lowered lifeboats on the starboard side. And the women and children first versus women and children only discussion that happens in the show is a supposed to be i guess a little nod to the fact that lightoller followed the rule women and children only extremely mm. stringently murdoch followed the rule women and children first and after women and children were boarded on lifeboats he did allow men to board on the starboard side mm. fascinating yeah so i'll go through other like titanic inaccuracies but i wanted to bring up lightoller because he in my opinion is the most egregiously strange out of all of them or it's like he's just and it's so interesting because everything he does could have been given to other characters. Like the Italian steward could have been the one who was handing out the hymn books. Yeah. Because that's what stewards would have done. And it's just like, I don't know why they made it just this one character who is like, I will do everything. I mean, it, it just kind of brings up the other just bizarre uh, script choices that they made for this and, and character yeah. choices and why they put people together when they put people together. Like, Even though we're only talking about episode one, it felt like this mini series should have been more than four episodes and should not have limited itself to only the first 30 minutes are going to be about character development. Then the rest of it, which is like the last 15 minutes, mm -hmm. are going to be about the iceberg and everybody reaching a cliffhanger point so that we can entice you with another episode. It's funny in that it's 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 it it feels like it both needs to be shorter and longer. But because mm -hmm. there's there so many plot points, but none of them get addressed properly, that the it ends up just being full of weird timing and weird pacing, and you end up interested in nothing and nobody. Yeah. And at least as far as episode one goes, zero closure whatsoever with any of these plot lines. Or no. I don't know about you, but I had no emotional connection to anyone because I didn't have enough time no. with them. And the people that I had too much time with, the Mantons, you hate them. We're terrible yeah right like everyone seems pretty awful and it's it gives you no reason to want to keep watching really it truly doesn't and i will be honest if if we were not watching it for this purpose mm -hmm. i don't know if i would have kept going after episode one because i would no. have just been like well i want this woman to to die and i don't know yeah. what happened to everybody else <laughs> No, it's just it it's just disappointing because it feels like there again there was so much more potential for it and it just got completely squandered. Yeah. And also it being the it being released on the hundredth anniversary. Mm -hmm. Seems it, like we put more time and care into producing like an amazing show, but I'm just not understanding how this fell so flat. Like it seems like it had everything set up for it and then this is what happened. Yeah, and I don't know enough backstory to know if there was, like, mm -mm. drama behind the scenes or a rush to, to edit it or something like that. Yeah. I also am, like, personally a little upset that they named it Titanic. Yeah, you had nothing else? Five other pieces of cinema are named Titanic. You couldn't even go with Titanic 666? Oh wait, that was taken. That was but it. just or anything else like Titanic's last voyage, 
Titanic Abby. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, literally anything else. Like, I don't know. Titanic sailing, Titanic crossing. That's the animal crossing. I don't know. I mean, it's just it's something. <laughs> yeah. Something else. Oh, but instead we just get Titanic. Yes. Do, do, do you have anything else on this episode? No, because the ep- like the episode ended yes, with did. Louisa literally going like, "I don't know if I want to get into that boat." This reminds me of the ending oh. of was it Twilight New Moon where Edward asks Bella to marry him and she just goes, <gasps> and then it gets to black. Oh god! It reminded me of that where it was like, "Get on the lifeboat." <sighs> Slack. Yeah. <laughs> Me. so i don't like i don't have a good way to like kind of close my thoughts for this episode because, because the show doesn't give me a good way yeah no, it just, just kind of it's like bye or it's almost like they filmed it as a four-hour thing they're like oh shit we were going to release this in parts <laughs> do they do you think that they looked at the uh two hour long uh 1997 movie and were like okay we could do better but let's make it like slightly longer than that. Well, the camera movie was three hours, so they added it's one like hour of runtime. Yes. Oh my gosh, you're right. For, okay, like... I know why I was thinking two hours because it was split up on two VHS. Yes, tapes. yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, I, this whole <laughs> I don't fault people. You know, I we've all seen something where we've liked the work, but then thought, wouldn't it be nice if they'd had more of a budget? You know, yes. we've all seen something like that. And it's usually something that I see with independent creators where I'm kind of like, man, I wish you had Hollywood's budget because I can clearly see where you're going with this. And I would love to see it full production value. This feels like that, except I know that they this wasn't some like ragtag team in a garage. This was a fully produced staff. And it's just so interesting that the creators of something so vibrant and colorful turned out something so boring and flat. It, it felt like this was a contractually obligated Mm -hmm. film for a lot of people yes it interestingly enough did which again it has such good source material has good actors it's just like how did you fuck this up so badly and somehow they did and somehow they did did. but mystery i mean we'll have to keep watching right to see yeah how badly they do this um, I want to. I want to find out how many times they sing "Mirror My God" to thee. <laughs> I remember that song already. Kind of completely forgot about that. <laughs> you know, unrelated to Titanic, they what was that show? Uh, they made a Netflix show a while ago that really heavily used that song too. Uh, it had to do with a. God damn it! It's one of those like horror shows. It was like a. A priest smuggles a demon back to his town. That's such a loss right now because okay, I'm right. like, which show? I know. I can't remember what it's called, but Sorry. yeah, this priest like smuggles a demon back to his small town and he's like, I thought it would help us. But yeah, the end of that show, basically everyone dies when the sun comes up because I guess they're vampires now. But yeah, they die singing Nearer My God to Thee. Hey. Were they called the Titanic? Was the village called the Titanic? No, but that's all I could think of. Because you just, the the end scene of all these people is just them singing a chorus of Nearer My God to Thee. And then all of a sudden it goes poignantly quiet as everyone just fucking dies. So that's a fair point. I don't really relate that song to anything besides the Titanic. No, I mean, the same way that All Star by Smash Mouth is exclusively related to Shrek. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yes certain songs just get tied to things and like yeah it was an interesting song choice considering how titanic-y it is in the cultural zeitgeist it was like I, that was a choice you made like congrats did um do you feel like if the historical accuracy of the set design were mm. better do you think that would have made this mini series more tolerable it would have made it more tolerable but it wouldn't have made it better mm-hmm. because it would ch- do nothing to change the flat performances it would change nothing to um deal with the how many side plots there were and then how drawn out certain scenes were it would have made it you know it would have been one of those plus sides where it's kind of like well it sucked but at least it really looked like the titanic 
that's fair i feel like it would have at least made it like i'm going to ignore what these people are saying and just look at the sure. pretty pretty set i mean that's fair honestly because one thing that i was talking uh, not talk, don lynch was talking to me about in his interview and um he talked about it more in his lecture was how part of the cameron film was a walkable set in that not it wasn't the whole ship but there was a certain part where he was saying that you could physically walk out of rosa's room and down the hall to the grand staircase and walk down it like you could do that and he was saying like what a magical experience that was to be able to walk out of a first class cabin down the first class hallway and into the grand staircase and just to walk down it and how incredible and beautiful of an experience that was and i can see where you were saying where you were just saying that it's like it would definitely have added that element of like of that wow factor because you get that wow factor in the cameron film like when you see the grand staircase in that glass dome you're like holy oh, wow that's yeah great. you yeah. have that impact so yes it would have given you that so yeah it would have at least been more tolerable but again it would have done absolutely nothing about the core elements of what would have made this a compelling show that's true that's very true um interestingly it does seem like some big sets were constructed yeah which for is, this show it, it is interesting and i guess my and this is a question that i don't even know if anyone could answer outside of the production team is the question might just simply be is in order to make that beautiful opulent titanic budget a concern like is the only reason camera was able to do it simply because he had the money to get the people to like make the replicas and the this and the that is like is is that genuinely what it takes if like if the answer is yes in order to make an authentically opulent titanic film you need the big bucks then that's the answer you kind of have and then it kind of sucks that you know you would try to do something that you know you can't tackle but if the answer is no you don't actually need a bunch of money you need ingenuity and creativity and to be able to source stuff then it's sort of like what are you guys doing so it's a weird question because yeah it looks like they had the money but it's sort of like was it the matter of you just didn't have enough money like you needed literal titanic money or did you just not spend it well <clears throat> yeah that's what i'm interested in too because the among the production companies that were involved in the titanic mm -hmm. miniseries are itv studios mm -hmm. so like this is and, and presumably julian fellows being uh -huh. the massive draw that he is from downton abbey Right. would have also helped them with a bigger budget and they yeah. filmed this in pinewood studios which is a massive studio so i don't know i don't know i i think i you know we we keep blaming a lot of stuff on like production um sure. and i think that maybe that's it maybe they did have the money mm -hmm. they had people that could have had the historical know-how how to build this stuff um and they just chose not to for Reasons. reasons lost to the bottom of the sea <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't it's hard to know hard to know it's just like without asking somebody without asking somebody who was in charge there's yeah. no way of knowing it's just once again it's kind of like well you clearly had a lot but you didn't make a lot oh well are you looking forward to seeing more characters in the future episodes that we didn't get to see in no. episode one <laughs> i mean i remember also thinking this too when i watched it through the first time because this this will be my second time watching it through is that by episode two i was like i don't care about any of these people yeah i i i have a hard time with uh shows if i don't care about the characters in the first episode or i'm not at least intrigued by the right. characters right. i'm not going to care about them the rest of the show nope. and i'm just going to be sitting here going i kind of hope all of you die yeah, and so far, no one is the the only people that you kind of might think are okay are Georgiana and Henry, and that's just because they're young and haven't said anything yet. Yeah, they're and what they have said is literally anachronistic. Yeah, it's weird. It's just like <laughs> they're just two young, pretty people who haven't said anything yet. So you know, that's the saving grace is that they've been largely silent. Yeah, or as you said, they've said weird stuff, such as. Well, what would I have to do to make myself your type? Well, you would just have to be a greaser, I guess. Yeah. Or, you know, stuff that any Victorian woman would say at the time, such yeah. as, I don't know if I really believe in this prejudice stuff that's happening here. I particularly liked it um, when, after Henry made a point, Georgiana was like, rock on. Yeah. 
<laughs> I'm being a little silly, but yeah, you can definitely tell that she's supposed to be like, ooh, ahead of her times, except she really speaks like she's ahead of her times. Yeah, she might as well have had a nose piercing for how much of a, like, <laughs> rebel she was. She, she needed to have her uh, cigarette moment. Mm-hmm. <sighs> well, I have nothing else for this one. Do you have anything else? I don't. I'm looking forward to us continuing this literal shipwreck. It's a literal shipwreck indeed. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, and we will see everybody next time. Bye.